Ness Nader, and um, this is God that we can gather together. Um, each Sunday that we get to do this feels special, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially because we just don't know in this ever-changing world, you know, what's going to happen next week. So every time we can gather, it's definitely a blessing. So let's stand together as we begin our time of worship. Building to this building 
and setting up the children's ministry was phenomenal. Um, and, and of course, that was now 11, 12 years ago. And, and some of you, of course, weren't here when that happened. But without her diligent work and, and setting up the children's way and getting all that organized, it was just, it was just great. And uh, I just want to pay tribute to her and to the family for that. Um, and, and before you as a congregation. Um, and over service, as you know, there'll be a family meeting, a uh, family you know, gathering time from 12 to 1.30 with the service at 1.30. Uh, if you plan to stay for the service, you can see these are the chairs that are set up. When the, when the chairs are full, no one else will be allowed to stay, but it'll be uh, recorded and you can be viewed later on the uh, YouTube channel that the church has. Uh, Herman has some thoughts he wanted to share. Can I have a mic, please? Uh, Herman has some thoughts he uh, wants to share about um, Yes, good, good morning. One other thing that I want to say that uh, Dorothy uh, one of, was one of the great supporters to Healthy Niños. Uh, I know that uh, when I received an email from Dorothy, uh, that was a big list. Um, and and always uh, have a, a Dennis uh, behind her, as uh, you can see here in the picture. This is one, this picture is almost one year ago when uh, members from Honduras came and they were so impressed to see Dorothy and her team. Uh, Dorothy was providing uh, baby kids for families in Honduras that they don't have anything. Uh, there are families in the countryside and Honduras and the poor countries that deliver the babies but they don't have any uh, receiving blanket, blanket or something like that. And Dorothy always was concerned and worried about that and we really, really appreciate that. Next one. Um, always, um, uh, Dorothy was always next to uh, fabric and other things. I, we always, uh, Dennis come to the uh, warehouse and with a lot of fabric and a lot of things that people can use it there in Honduras. And we always uh, really, really appreciate that. Next one, I think is the last one. Um, I always was talking with her, I say, I wish you can see the final destination. This is the final destination. Quilt and their families received and believe me that they will keep uh, for many years. For those families, it means a lot to have something that they can cover and that they can have for the babies. Um, forever will be um, always appreciate all the authority and uh, her team was doing for Honduras. Thank you very much. One could go on for the rest of the morning, so we won't. But uh, I think the challenge is for us is who's going to take your place? Now, nobody can take her place specifically, I realize, but a lot of the work that she was doing for Healthy Ninos is somewhere she picked it up in Boston, somehow or another. If not here, somewhere, but we'll have to pray about that. Her. So, yeah, while we're thinking about uh, missions as well, I want to just give a little update also. I talked with Bob Stevenson this week, uh, and, and the the situation in Mexico is pretty much stabilized as far as the health is concerned, but they have the same situation we do. They're limited. They're, they are limited to no more than 500 people in a gathering. Oh, right. But when you have when you have three to five thousand together on a Sunday morning, it, it, it's a challenge. So they have the three services now at Monte Maria Church. They have they count everybody because they have 490. And then they can cut it off. In the first, in the first two services, each service is 490. The third service is somewhere over 300. But uh, so, but they're they're dealing with the same things we do, wearing masks and social distancing. Uh, fortunately, there's not much infections right now, and that that part's been good. But in the mountain villages, there's nothing out there at all. So uh, they're they're very fortunate uh, from that standpoint. Hilo Singo, where we've gone. Uh, you know, seven, eight times now. They had a baptism. They had 17 people from the church were baptized uh, a couple weeks ago. So God's still moving and working. And so uh, thanks for your ongoing support there. We had hoped to do a, um, 
a pancake breakfast here this fall in anticipation of a team going again in February, but we can't do the pancake breakfast, so I don't know, somehow I'll have to try and raise a few dollars to, to give uh, toward the ministry there. We're hoping we can go in February. If we can't, we're going to send the money down and they'll have to do it without us. Um, another prayer of concern uh, for Brother Al, who's here this morning. Al's been spending a day or two in the hospital this week. His sugar was out of balance. and. Uh, so thanks God that you're back and uh, continue to pray for Al as he adjusts to life without Judy. And I just got word this morning, John and Joan is not doing well. Is that, is that right? She's not eating? No. No, yeah. she's not eating much at all. All right, so Joan Gaiman, who's at the Phoebe uh, nursing facility, is not eating well and eating. She's not doing well. So keep John and Joan in prayer to uh, for this challenging time. Are you able to visit with her at all, John? Last night I went over after dark and uh, they put lights on and they actually raised the window so I could actually talk to her through the window. All right. And, uh, but I said, hi, my Jerry. You know, one of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. One of the challenges during COVID is people cannot visit their loved ones. I mean, that's that's yeah. at least they're very limited. So. Welcome, Herman Lois up this morning. It's good to have you here from all the way from <laughs> Let's pray over these needs. God, thank you for your your faithfulness and love that we mentioned earlier. We give you thanks this morning for the life and the faithfulness of Dorothy and who she was as a person and all that she did. Give you thanks for her ministry here within our church, through primarily the children's ministry, walking alongside of Dennis as he was associate pastor for many years, for her work with healthy ninos and all the sewing that she did. Who she was as a, as a wife, as a mother, and as a grandmother. We give you thanks for her godly example. We pray your grace and your comfort with us, but also with her family. The Lord, raise up, raise up persons to continue some of the ministry that she was doing. May your grace be upon us. Thank you that Al is back in the hospital. We pray your grace upon with him, Lord, and comfort. She's adjusted to life without Judy, Lord. And for John and Joan, oh God, again we ask for your, your mercy, your grace, your comfort, and your presence. Grant them, oh God, grant John peace, comfort his heart. Let me know Joan and those that care for her. We thank you for the missionaries that we support around the world and for the those in Mexico today, in Hilotzingo and in Mexico City, Lord, may your spirit continue to build the church there and bless their congregational lives and protect them from the virus, Lord. Give Bob with physical strength, spiritual strength, Lord, during these challenging days to lead the church. For others, Lord, all of those we support in Germany and in Spain, we just pray for your grace upon them, Lord. Now, Lord, for our time of worship, thank you for Janelle and the team. Bless this time of worship as we speak to you, O Lord, receive our praise and an offering to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Remind you, if you brought an offering this morning, to put it in the mailbox slot there in the foyer. Well, I just wanted to share a little story with you.
just asked. Can't hurt to ask, right? Jesus, doing the best. Would you stand with us as we can continue to worship? From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And as we sing this song, these words really take on a new, powerful meaning as we proclaim them. As we sing, in holiness you stand secure through culture shifting sands, unchanged by all the vanities of man. And as the nations rise and fall, your sovereignty remains. You are the one true God. Sing this out this morning as a declaration to remind our hearts and our spirits what the truth you
judgment that the enemy hurls at us. You call us to look to you and not our circumstances, to trust and obey your words and to follow you even into the unknown. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus.
yes, yes, we will follow you. Take us deeper than we would go, than we would choose to go. Lord, just strengthen our faith. Lord, we just pray for clarity through the truth of your word, as Pastor Ness preaches, and help us to walk out our faith, whatever it is that we are facing this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Your name is
If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the, him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He said, don't resist an evil person. Rather, you, 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 you give to the one who would ask of you, and so on, etc. Now, this idea of an eye for eye and tooth for tooth comes from the Old Testament. And we might think, well, that means if you, uh, you hit me, I have the right to hit you back. What the Old Testament teaching was, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, was to limit, in the Old Covenant, to limit my response to you. Meaning, if you plucked out my eye, all I could do is take out your eye. I could not kill you. If you knocked out my tooth, the most I could do back to you was to knock out your tooth. I couldn't beat you to a pulp and put you in the hospital. You understand? <laughs> It was not dictating that one had to do that even to limit the amount of response on the part of the person who was offended. Jesus said, you have heard that. That's the teaching of the Old Covenant. But I say it to you. And so now a change is coming. That was then, but this is now. But I say to you, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Let's go on to the next section. Love for enemies. In uh, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? We're not even tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now he takes us another time. Now he talks about the people. He said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, again, a change is coming. A change is coming. While the Old Testament is important to us, and without the Old Testament, it's almost impossible to understand the New Testament, I do not believe in what some people call a flat Bible. And that is that the Old Testament has equal authority in our lives as the New Testament. I believe that the New Testament supersedes the Old in that Jesus established a new way of living that goes beyond what we find in the Old Testament. And here is an example where he says, it was, you have heard, or it was taught, but now I say to you, this is the way you study me. That was the way it was then, but this is how it is now. And what I'm saying to you now is you are to love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. And what does he say we will be if that happens? You will be the sons of God. I don't have time to expound on all, what all that means. But he's saying, I want you to treat and to live toward your enemies as God does to us. Now, if it was up to me, there are certain people who would never get rain on their garden. <laughs> <laughs> all right? It was up to me there were certain people whose car would not start on a cold, freezing morning. Right? Their car would never start on a morning like that. They'd have to get out there in the cold and the snow and they'd have to really work to try to get it home. But is that how God treats us? What does he say? God sends his rain on who? The righteous, the unrighteous. God sends his rain. Now, we do know that there are times, for example, examples in the Old Testament where God's people sinned and God withheld rain from them for a period of time. But generally speaking, when it rains, it doesn't rain only on the righteous person's farm. It rains on everybody's farm. That's the way it is. 
the sun comes up in the morning, it doesn't only shine on your property, it also shines on mine. Right? So what he's saying is God treats everyone alike. And therefore we should also treat our enemies as we treat our friends. If you only love the people who love you, what is that? If anybody can do that, pagans do that. It's like loving your football team when, they, when they're always winning. That's great, but when they're losing, do you still love them? No. It's time to fire the coach, it's time to change the quarterback. But if, but if you only love people who love you, anybody can do that. If, if, if I treat you nice, you can treat me nice, it's easy. But what do I do when you don't treat me nice? Mm. That's where faith comes in. And we, we just sang it in this song, Lord, take me out in the deep where my feet can't touch the bottom, so I have to exercise faith. Here's a call to the followers of Jesus to a higher standard. He says, if we do this, we will be perfect as God is perfect. Go to the last verse. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow. You mean we're going to be perfect? Depends how you mean. That word perfect does not necessarily mean without flaw. It talks about being complete and fulfilled in Christ. And fulfilling his will. But we trust and obey, as we sang earlier this morning. So our basis of the love of others is not resisting them, but is to love them. The love that we demonstrate by Jesus, that we see in Jesus, is to be is the model, is modeled by him, and we are to live that out. Let's look at some examples of Jesus. For example, during his entire life of 33 years, he demonstrated a love for others and a self-denial of his own rights. He came not to do his will, but the will of his Father who is in heaven. And throughout his earthly ministry, he was opposed by many people. Now, he had some harsh words for the religious leaders who were his enemies. He had some very harsh words for them. But, you know, he welcomed them around him. He would go to their houses to eat. He would sit down and have a meal with them. But think about his arrest in the garden. There he was, praying, and then Judas, and the, and, and the soldiers come to arrest him. Did he resist them? In his trial, he refused to defend himself or to call upon angels to save him. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You can be glad he hung on that cross and not me. I, I'd have called a few angels and sat a couple of people with me. <laughs> Right. All I'm going to take was just a wink and bam! They can call and try right in front of them, you know? Now, that, that's the example. That's, that, that, that's what he left us, and then we're going to talk about that also a little bit later on when, when, when the, the, you see Peter. But he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Do you realize that most of the times when we have an enemy, it's because they don't realize what they're doing. See, we, we, each of us three see life through our lens. I see life through my perspective, and so I see it this way. But you see it a different way. But because I see it this way, I tend not to be open to try to see it your way, because I think my way is the right way. And I may not realize, I may not realize how much I'm hurting you by what I say or what I do. Because I'm not aware of your perspective. Jesus says we are forgiven. Your enemies. We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's go on to Romans chapter 12. How do you, how do you forgive? As it were, how do we love? What is it? What are some practical ways? What, how does this take shape? And Paul mentions that in Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Wow, let's just stop right there. 
and not repay anyone evil for evil. What's the goal of the rule? Do it to others before they do it to you. Right? Right? Do it to others before they do it to you. No, he said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. So someone does evil to me, ah, don't repay them in the same time. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, I love, I love Paul. I'm so glad he put that in there. <laughs> if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, what? Live at peace with everyone. See, we have a part to play in this. If I am in control of my life, if I'm in control of my emotions, if I'm surrendered to the the authority of Jesus Christ, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit is truly active and working within me, then you will not dictate my reactions and my life. Mm -hmm. Alright? So you may say or do what you want against me, but I do not have to retaliate. I do not have to get even. I can, I can, in my heart, I can forgive you and I can be at peace within myself because I'm not going to allow you to dictate my actions. And, oh, I wish I could have practiced that all my life. <laughs> oh, my, just ask Jan what would happen on the road. You know, some guy, I hate these people when a four-lane highway and they come flying up on the right-hand lane and try to duck in front of you quick into the left lane. And you've got to hit the brakes. Boy, they knew I had a horn, believe me. <laughs> and it's good they couldn't hear it. <laughs> that, that irritates me. You see, can I, can I? Limit my response to someone who opposes me? Or is it just like a like a trigger? You just push the right button and I explode all over you. For years I did that. I was I couldn't control my own emotions. He goes on. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't seek revenge, and then he goes on to say, if your enemy is hungry, what? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not let be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's so easy to be overcome by evil, rather than overcoming evil with good. One more biblical example. I'm going to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2. And uh, in verse, uh, he talks about uh, bearing up under hardships and so on. In verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him and judged justly. He himself bore our sins in his body in the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus left us an example to follow in his steps. Years ago there was a book written by that title. What does it mean? We used to wear these bracelets, WWJD. What did Jesus do? Or what would Jesus do? He left an example to follow in his steps. Now, brothers and sisters, I know I am not Jesus. In case you didn't know that. And I know you're not Jesus either. And I know we're never going to live up to this perfectly. But it's the model and it's the example he held up before us. It's out there for us. So, let's look at that. Let's look at that. Let's look at some examples in history. The church, or the Mennonite church, has its roots in the 16th century Reformation. We came from the group called the Anabaptists who sought to obey Jesus' teaching to love their enemies. And they, they refused to take up arms. And put up this next picture. 
I want, I, want to, I want to tell you about this man. You know who the guy in, in, in the black hat is? He's not an Irishman. Right? He's not an Irishman. His name is Dirk Willows. And Dirk Willows was an Anabaptist in Holland in the 1500s. And he had been in prison, and, and someone uh, was able to get a rope, and he came, escaped out of the prison, out of the window, down, and was running away, and his, and his captor ran after him to capture him. And Dirk Willows ran across this frozen canal and got to the other side, and his, his pursuer fell through the ice. Now what would you do? Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. So Dirk Willows turned back and pulled the man out of the, out of the frozen canal, saved his life. The man would have left Dirk Willems go free, but those standing on the shore said, you cannot do that, he's a hate and a Baptist. And so Dirk Willems was rearrested, put into prison, and two days later was beheaded. Dirk Willems. Another story. Out of the same time period in Switzerland, there was an Anabaptist preacher, and his wife was sleeping one night, and they, when they heard a noise on the roof of their house. And he got up and went out and looked, and here there were a group of men who hated him because he was a preacher of salvation and because he opposed the state church. Uh, they were tearing the roof, of the thatched roof off his house. So he went back in and said to his wife, Dear, we have visitors at night. Get up and make something to eat. <laughs> and so when they were done, he, said, he went out there and said, Oh, you've been working hard now all night to tear off this roof. You must be hungry. Come on in and eat. And of course, they didn't want to do that, but he something about his character. He prevailed upon them. They came in and sat down at the table and, and ate a meal that his wife had prepared. And while they were eating, he explained the way of salvation, the way of the cross to them. And they repented and went back out and put the roof back on his house. You say, well, that's crazy. Say, Who does that? Well, many people have done that. What about today? How, how does this how does it manifest itself today? What does loving your neighbor look like today? What does loving your enemy look like today? Our lives are not threatened. We're not arrested and put in prison. I think we need to learn, we need to testify that, that the power of love over hate. And we need this so much in our nation today. All the rioting and burning that's been going on in our nation grieves my heart. And it's not going to accomplish the ends to which they want. Listen, you get that. Let me, let me quote from, from Dr. Martin Luther King. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Is there an amen in the church? Amen. I know we know that, but do we believe it? And how am I practicing, how am I practicing that? How do you find ways to bless and not curse? How do you find ways to show kindness instead of retaliation? I'll tell you one way, loving your enemy, or your neighbor at least, is when, when you're a Trump supporter, and your neighbor is a Biden supporter, and you see that his sign for Biden fell over in the yard, and you go stand it back up again. Huh? Hello? Yeah. Mike Buck? <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> love your neighbor, love your enemy, right? Not that Biden supporters are necessarily the enemy of Trump supporters or vice versa, but we think of it almost in that way, don't we? See, we've been polarized in our nation beyond measure. In all my 73 years, I've never seen such polarization in my life. And again, I come back to the statement I made earlier, and Pastor Mike talked about this last week, just because we disagree politically does not make us enemies. And Joe Biden is not my enemy. If things hold out the way that we think it will, he's going to be our president. He's not my enemy. Now, whether you support him or not, whether you like him or not, that's beside the point. The point is, he is not our enemy. Unless or until he, as president, may come against the church or come against Christian beliefs and, and then try to force us to do something which is immoral, illegal, or opposed to the scripture. But just be, being of a different political party doesn't make him an enemy. And so, Mike, I commend you for that. Find ways to bless and not curse. We, we choose to suffer rather than retaliate. Many years ago, we first moved to Skip Back. 
Janet and I, or Janet grew up with dairy goats on the farm, and we wanted to have some goats. We had a little barn here, we had an acre and a quarter, let's get some goats, and so we did. We had, we had uh, two nannies, and on St. Patrick's Day, 1973, she gave birth to twins, and we were so happy, we put up a fence, and the neighbor kids were there, and loved these little adorable buildings. Little goats, you know, and they were so fun to watch. And Jan had enjoyed milking them, and we used to milk, and it was, it was great. Man. It was like, it was like. So one day, the zoning officer of the township came to Charlie. He said, I got a complaint about your goats, you got to get rid of them. I said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, he, your barn is too close to the property line to have animals in it. You had to 30 feet away from the property line. I said, well, I came to you before I bought the goats and asked you if it was okay. He said it was. And I said, my barn was there before you had zoning code. He said, yeah, but it wasn't used as a barn for many years, and now you're using it as a barn. He said, you're in violation. I'm sorry to tell you, you have to be rid of your, your ass. I said, you mean if I have a rat in the barn, I'm violating the township code? He said, well, technically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our neighbor, so... He said, what was your neighbor next door? That complaint. So I talked to the neighbor next door, and he said, I'm not going to live next door to a farm. Dirty old farm animals, goats or farm animals. I said, well, they're pets. No, they're not. He said, I'll take you to court if I got to. Now, what would you do? The neighbors all said, take him to court. <laughs> make everybody else in the township who has an animal in a barn within 30 feet of the property line, make them get rid of their animals, too. Oh, that sounds appealing. I said, no, I can't do that. So we got rid of it. But on his deathbed, in the hospital, I could talk to him about Jesus and whether or not he was ready to meet his maker and where he was going to spend eternity. That was worth more to me than having a couple of dairy goats in my home. Hello? Amen. Talking about seeking ways to bless and not curse. Rather than encourage, rather than retaliate. And so, how do you live like this? Well, it's not easy. Take me deeper, we sang a while ago. It's not done in human strength. Human, human strength is not sufficient. Loving your enemy requires divine grace. This is the kind of love that comes from the mother's very nature is love. God the Father through the Holy Spirit enables us, enables us to live like this. It's when we choose to build rather than tear down. And I respect everyone, and I respect those of you who have served in the military in 66. When the draft is going, rather than going to Vietnam and taking life, I choose to work in a nursing home and help support the life of old people. But you see, only that, that, that comes through the through relationship with Jesus Christ. If we confess our sin and confess Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit lives in us, given His power to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to bless rather than curse. I call it the James 3.18. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. God, thank you for your word this morning. A very challenging word. A very, very difficult word for us. That humanly speaking, we know it's, it's impossible for us. But thank you that you give us grace and through a relationship with you and the power of the Holy Spirit to love our enemies. God, I ask you to help us today to know what that means. How does this live itself out in the United States of America in 2020 and in 2021? How do, can we in our communities and how we in our world and where we live and where we work and where we go to school, how do we demonstrate love to all? love our enemies. And show them the way of the cross. Show them the way of salvation. Show them that your kingdom is greater than an earthly kingdom. Testify to your love and your goodness and your desire to have a relationship with all. So thank you, God, for this challenging message. In 
thank you for your grace and your power that enables us to live it out. Through Jesus, amen. For our closing song, we're going to try singing a new song that I believe Christian Bueller had um, taught or introduced earlier this summer called The Blessing. And I love the simplicity of this song, and I love that we can sing a blessing over each other, which is easy to do when we're singing it or we're doing that with people that we love. But this morning, in light of what Pastor Ness has shared with us, can we think of that person that you're struggling with, that person that maybe it's an actual enemy, or maybe it's someone that you just just a challenge for you to get a moment. Just invite you as we sing this song to be thinking of that person and to be able to claim, declare this blessing over them. Would you stand as we sing the blessing?